Good morning, good afternoon, everybody. So today, myself and Cameron, one of my teammates, will be talking a little bit about uh, some new APIs that released on Microsoft Graph. Uh, these are specifically for the eDiscovery APIs. So we'll talk a little bit about how you can automate this, what are some of the use cases, and then Cameron will actually walk us through some demos uh, to be able to see some of the stuff actually in action. So we'll give a quick little overview again on the APIs themselves. Uh, we'll go into some use cases, some demos, talk a quick little bit about some of the license implications for this. Um, also, how you can actually go and get a demo or a trial environment for this. Uh, great thing. All oh, these GIFs are awesome. Thank you everyone for sharing those in the chat. Uh, and then we'll, if we have any time at the end, we'll have a little bit of uh, Q&A time. Now, there's a couple of new APIs that have released or are in the process of releasing for uh, what we call Security, Compliance, Identity, and Management, SKIM. Um, so for this, the main ones that we're going to be focusing on today are right in the middle. This is our eDiscovery Premium APIs. Uh, if you're interested in seeing which all ones are included with this V1 release, you can go to aka.ms slash eDisco graph API. Um, there are a handful of these that were in beta previously that did not make their way to V1. Um, this includes the export, files, holds, uh, hold policies, and also the purge data action that was out there. Um, these are ones that are still in beta. We're working on getting them over to V1, um, but for time being though, you can actually see all these things out there uh, on our V1 endpoint. So great to see this thing come from uh, beta, make their way over to V1. Now, in terms of the actual, what can I do with these APIs? Uh, the idea here is that um, for a long time now, we've had the Security and Compliance Center uh, inside of M365. Uh, this actually has gone through a rebranding. You'll now see it referred to as Microsoft Purview. It's kind of a, our combination together of what was Azure Purview along with a lot of the Security and Compliance pieces. They're now actually under one brand called Microsoft Purview. And as part of this, we still have the compliance portal for this. There's a lot of things you can do from a e-discovery search standpoint. Um, the idea being, maybe you're a litigator, maybe you're someone who is a lawyer, maybe you've got an auditor who's coming in, and you need to actually go and do a search across all the different um, elements within your tenant, whether it's inside of SharePoint, in Exchange, in Teams, in Azure AD, a lot of other places. Um, how can I go and find all that content, maybe again for a yearly audit, or maybe I'm doing some kind of legal case, and you need to go and actually go and find that content. To date, you've had to go through the UI to actually go and find all that content, be able to export it, be able to put it together into um, cases, into review sets, into a lot of other kind of things like that. Uh, the idea here though is with these APIs, now we can actually automate a lot of that process. So if you are in the process of trying to do something in terms of a repeated process where, hey, I'm doing this you know, 10 times a day or maybe more, um, I want to kind of automate that process. Or maybe you're looking for a way to integrate with third-party software, uh, a great way to be able to actually pull that content in, be able to work with it in other solutions. Um, this is going to help from them, uh, for their standpoint, being able to integrate and actually do things like case creation or managing custodians, uh, but being able to put together the uh, collections for this or run analytics, uh, things like that. So there's a lot of great things we can do basically to automate uh, what was only available in the UI, now make it available for our customers to be able to use or for folks like our um, ISV partners or SI partners to be able to integrate with this as well to leverage their own solutions uh, that build on top of uh, that security and compliance pieces. Now there's a couple of different kind of sample queries that we'll be walking through, but some things you can just kind of see from a very high level on here. Uh, when it comes time for doing things like that automated case creation, you can see we've got some very simple uh, kind of URLs to go against. Uh, basically, there's some different post commands on here. We can actually go, and you'll notice that also, uh, we're also under the security root node. This is a change from previous. In the past, it was under slash compliance. Um, as part of this, you know, again, the rebranding, the reorg under the Microsoft Purview label, we're now going to be under the slash security for this. So find all of those under that uh, slash security. Um, you can see, see things like doing management of the cases. So again, slash cases, slash e-discovery cases. You can specify the um, different payloads you need for this. Also for creating custodians, similar kind of path for this. You'll just pass in what's that e-discovery case ID, and then also who are the custodians um, that are going to be tied to this. That's basically the mailboxes or maybe even some of the sites uh, that are going to be subject to that um, search that you're doing. And you can even do things like apply holds to those custodians. So once you've set them inside of the case, now you can actually go and say, hey, retain this content so I can actually go and do my, again, due process. I can do any kind of uh, review that I need with this. Um, if you'd like finding the different documentation for this, great link down at the bottom out into our uh, documentation for this. We'll make sure to put that out into the um, chat as well so you have that for your purposes. 
Another example out here for things like that workflow automation, um, if you're going to actually go and create the searches, you can specify what is that um, content search, what are the keywords, the other kind of things you're passing them for. You can look at the statistics for this, how many mailboxes were held, what's the size of them, um, number of sources found, a lot of other kind of content like that. So great ways to be able to actually go and um, access this, do the automation processes, and actually see what's available to you. Now, Enough for me talking. I'm actually going to turn things over to my teammate Cameron. He's going to walk us through a little bit of some demos uh, showing these things actually live. So, Cameron, uh, if you want to share out your screen, and the floor will be yours. All right. Thanks, Brian. Uh, so, I've got a Postman collection here that we can share out. And so, what we're going to be going through today is the uh, essentially demo scenario for case creation, which is just one of the use cases that you could automate with the eDiscovery APIs here. And so with this collection, uh, I've got my environment variables already populated with my tenant ID, client ID, client secret, et cetera. So in this case, we're using delegated permissions. Uh, so following that authorization code off flow here to get our token. So I'm going to go ahead and get my token. Uh, now, you'll notice that in this scenario, it just went ahead and, and it gave me my token. That's because I had previously consented to this permission, which is this ediscovery.readwrite.all. So just something to be aware of if you're going through this for the first time. So moving into the case creation, uh, we first got here our list ediscovery cases. So if you've got any you know, pre-existing cases, you can, of course, use this API to enumerate those. Um, but uh, to kind of uh, get into the actual creation portion, we've got this post call here uh, to the eDiscovery cases endpoint. I've got a few of my variables populated here with the display name, description, and an external ID that you can use if you're trying to tie that uh, this eDiscovery case to like some external ticketing system, right? And so uh, just to kind of show you where that's coming from, right? I've got my variables here. Uh, some of these will come pre-populated with the collection, but of course I've got a few of of my own that's specific to uh, to my my test environment here. So with that, we'll go ahead and we'll send this request to get our case created. So if everything is all in well, we'll get back a response and you can see here that our case has now been created for us. Uh, we can then take that a step further and see that this is now populated. Now you may be wondering where this came from. And so in this collection under this test tab here, what happens is we take that and that essentially that ID that gets returned from the case creation and then feed that into that eDiscovery case ID variable. And so that can then be used to feed into this get call here to uh, if we want to just retrieve that specific case or the details about that case. And so if you want to make an update, like let's say we want to update that external case ID for some reason, uh, you can use this patch call to update that uh, that same eDiscovery case. And so if we actually jump back, we'll see that was successful. So we'll rerun this query and see that when we look at the external ID, we'll see that it was now updated to the value that we passed in this patch call for that update. Uh, following that, we wanna make sure that we add those custodians. So we're going to go ahead and add a custodian here that again is, is populated uh, from, uh, from one of my, my variables. And I'm going to go ahead and send that to get the custodian uh, created, which is just essentially adding that custodian to the case. Let that complete. All right. And so now one thing to note here, you can see that the hold status is not applied. So we'll be applying a hold here shortly. But before we do that, right, we can go ahead and again, there's a call to list the custodians. Uh, so, you know, for now, of course, we just have this one. So you'll just see this one listed here in the collection that gets returned for the list you discovery custodians call. Uh, but before, again, we apply that hold, we're going to want to go ahead and add those user sources for that custodial resource, right? So in this particular case, we're going to add that user's mailbox in sight. Uh, again, the custodian email uh, is being populated from those variables. And I'm going to go ahead and send this request that we can see that I populated with the eDiscovery case ID as well as my custodian ID for that custodian that I had created. And then looking down, we can see that those sources got created. All right, and then now that we've got our custodian created, we've got our uh, sources created for that custodian, we're going to go ahead and apply the hold for that custodian. All right, we get our 202 accepted, acknowledging that that has been done successfully. And so now if we actually go and we list our user sources, uh, we can see that we've got our, our user sources here for our custodian and a hold status of applying. So that lets us know that we, we are in fact in the process of applying that hold uh, to that custodian for those data sources. 
Now, you can take that a step further as well and add non-custodial data sources if you'd like, just like you can through the eDiscovery UI. And so in this particular case, uh, we've got, again, another email for a, another uh, data source that, again, in this case is going to be non-custodial, so not associated with that custodian that we created earlier. Um, so we're going to go ahead and create that non-custodial uh, user source, which is their email address. So in other words, it's, it's tying that non-custodial resources mailbox to this case. Uh, and as you can see here, similar to the custodian, we have not applied uh, a hold yet. So we are actually going to have to call that non-custodial data sources endpoint to apply the hold to that non-custodial data source as well. And so we will go ahead and do that. Okay, so it looks like we did get an error in that case, but if we test this real quick, uh, just to take a look at that non-custodial, we can see that it actually did apply that hold. So we do have a hold status of applying there. So Brian, I'll go ahead and turn it back to you. Excellent. Appreciate you walking through us that with uh, the different samples on there, Cameron. And we'll go back to my pleasure. Now we did have a couple of questions pop up in the chat window and we'll address them actually on here on this slide. Um, regarding the licensing slash monetization for these APIs, um, do note that in order to actually use these APIs, um, this is again part of eDiscovery Premium. It does require the applicable license. Um, you can see them on here on the screen. They're also in the blog post. Um, there's a link down at the bottom on this. So you need to have at least an E5 license or the similar type of um, compliance or security compliance. Um, so there's also an eDiscovery and audit uh, license that are out there. Now, that is licensing required just to call the APIs in general. There's also one specific endpoint on here called add to review set. This is going to be what we call a consumption or a metered uh, endpoint. Uh, the idea being that behind the scenes, when we actually call into this API, it's doing a lot of heavy lifting on the back end. And as such, um, there will be a consumption cost tied to that. Um, if you have E5 licenses, again, which required above, that will give you what we call seeded capacity. Uh, the idea being that, hey, it'll give you for each license a certain amount of um, storage. Uh, I think I believe it's one gigabyte um, per license per month. And that will be pooled basically against your tenant so that you can actually call against. So as long as you have sufficient E5 licenses, um, you may not actually see any kind of costs tied to this. If you're doing a very large, excuse me, very large amount of queries into the system or using up a lot of that storage, there may be um, some overs charges that will be tied to that. But take a look at the blog post where you can see more on this. Uh, the charges are not in effect today, but they will come online probably in the um, calendar year 23 timeframe. One quick mention on here on permissions. Um, these are only supporting delegated permissions today. We are working on application permissions. Uh, and note that because it requires delegated, you will have to have the appropriate um, role assigned in purview, um, usually things like eDiscovery Manager, eDiscovery Administrator, or similar for these things. If you are looking for a demo environment, as we've mentioned earlier on in the calls, the Microsoft 365 Developer Program, great way to actually go and get that, again, 90-day uh, trial tenant out there. You can find the Postman collection that um, Cameron's working with on here, aka.ms slash ediscovery slash Postman. There's ways to actually import that into your environment. And just a quick little note on the API documentation for this, you can find more at aka.ms slash ediscovery slash API. Be able to read up on this and see more of what's available for this with that. Appreciate everyone joining in today. Um, thank you so much for the time and look forward to folks using this in their environments. Really cool. Thank you, Cameron. Thank you, Brian. Really, really awesome stuff. And it's great to see the continuously new APIs and new capabilities which are added on Microsoft Graph. So awesome, awesome stuff. Mm -hmm.